without me. All right, looks like our recording is um, up and running and I need the presenter ball so I can advance my slides. Sorry, I thought I was ready to go. Oh, Ste Stephanie, could you maybe um, drag the ball back to me, please? Because it's not letting me take it. That was pretty nifty. Yeah, there we go. Okay, now I can, I have some control. All right, so um, welcome everyone, and um, hopefully you've had a chance to um, check your audio. Um, that slide's here on the screen. So um, if you haven't done that already, please go ahead and um, check your audio. We do use um, our mics during the webinars um, if you want to you know, ask a question verbally, but um, we also put questions into chat, so it's fine if you're um, mic's not working. But if you are experiencing um, any audio trouble or you don't have a headset or speakers, uh, please feel free to use the call-in number instead. And I'm putting that into the chat for you again, um, just so y'all have that. All right, and um, so welcome to our second webinar of the IGNIS season. I cannot believe we've been doing this for five years. We've had lots of great speakers and lots of great topics. Um, just as a reminder, and for those of you who haven't attended an IGNIS webinar before, um, IGNIS is the Latin word for spark or ignite, and that is exactly what we are hoping to do today to ignite your curiosity and spark your intellect. This webinar series is brought to you by the Office of E-Learning and Open Education at the Washington State Board for Community and Technical Colleges. And your hosts today are myself, Alyssa Sells, and Mark Carbon. And um, we will share our contact information with you, but we'll do that at the end of the webinar. And I think Stephanie's got her contact information to share with you later as well. So our topic today is managing difficult conversations in the online classroom. And our presenter is the fabulous Stephanie Delaney. Um, she's one of my favorite e-learning people. So um, just a big thank you to Stephanie for joining us today and sharing all of her knowledge and expertise with us this afternoon. So um, really excited to um, hear what she has to say on this really great topic this afternoon. All right, um, please note that all of our Webinars are captioned, and I'd like to thank ACS for their real-time captioning services. And you can access um, those captions online. And I'm going to go ahead and put that link into the chat for you. And um, it's a bit.ly link. It's bit.ly slash ignis, all in capitals, dash live, all in capitals, and then today's date, 041218. So those are there for you if you'd like to, to read along. Um, you can also access um, the WebEx uh, keyboard shortcuts if you prefer to use um, the shortcuts on your keyboard rather than your mouse today. Um, those um, can be accessed at the link that I just put into the chat. So those are there for you as well. Let me get to our next slide. So this webinar is recorded, and all of our um, webinars are recorded, and you can access those recordings on the ATL blog, and there's a screenshot of the blog there. You just go to uh, the, the home page of the blog, and then you can select from the IGNIS menu um, whatever it is that you're looking for, and I just put a bit.ly link to the ATL blog into the chat for you if you want to go look at previous resources. Uh, the recording for this webinar will be posted in about 10 days. I do have to send it out for captioning. We don't post them um, until they're, they're fully captioned. So there is a little bit like a week and a half delay on those. Um, but we do post all of the resources and the recordings, and you can find them for the last five years. So everything is there. There's also a schedule if you decide that you liked this webinar and would like to attend another one. Uh, the schedule can be found on that blog site also. Okay, I'm a little slow to advance the slides. Okay, 
So um, for those of you who have attended our webinars before, you'll notice that we have switched web, web conferencing tools this year. So um, we used to use Collaborate. Uh, now this year we're using WebEx. And I'm just going to go through just really, really briefly an overview of the meeting interface for anyone who may not be familiar with WebEx. And then I'm going to hand it over to Mark to um, do an official introduction of Stephanie. So um, the first thing you might want to note is that um, you can find the list of participants and the participant tools. And those are in the participants panel, and that's near the top right of your screen. Uh, we are going to be using the chat feature a lot today, so get ready to type. And um, all of your questions and comments and responses to anything Stephanie asks you to participate in can go right into the chat panel, and that's near the bottom right of your screen. And there are little arrows that you can click to expand and close those just depending on um, what you want to look at. So um, one thing about the chat is do be sure to uh, select everyone from the drop-down menu when you're sending a message that will make sure that it goes to everyone who's in the webinar today and not just to me or um, Mark or Stephanie. So just watch for that. Um, and then there's a WebEx help link in case um, you're having a hard time and need to look at the help resources. That's on um, the menu options near kind of the top middle of your screen and um, that's kind of left middle-ish. And then um, you can also enter full screen if you're having a hard time viewing um, the regular size of the um, slides. Sometimes they're a little small and hard to see. So you can enter full screen by clicking on the arrows to expand your screen, and that's also near the top middle. So um, just some features to be aware of. Now if you get stuck in full screen and want to get out of that, um, to exit just use the escape key on your keyboard or there is also a return key that's on the pop down menu. And to find the menu you just need to hover near the top of your screen and that menu will pop down for you and then you can just click on that return key. All right, we're almost done here. So um, last thing to note is to please raise your hand if you want to speak. That will let us know that you'd like to be called on. And there's a little hand icon uh, in the participants tool. So if you raise your hand, um, we'll call on you. And then also there's a microphone button or icon that you can use to mute and unmute your mics. Um, everybody was muted when they entered the room just to avoid background noise, so if you do um, decide to raise your hand and ask a question verbally, you will need to unmute yourself or we won't be able to hear you. All right, well, I think that is the end of my spiel, so I am, um, oops, that's our next presenter. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Mark now to introduce Stephanie, and then um, while he's doing that, I'm going to go ahead and bring up her slides, and then we'll let her take it away from there. She's got lots of great stuff planned today. So Mark, you're up. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks there, Alyssa. Yes, I get the pleasure of introducing our wonderful speaker for the day. I think a lot of the folks in the participant list I recognize. So Dr. Stephanie Delaney is joining us today from South Seattle uh, Community College. She's currently the Dean of Academic Transfer Programs. Um, Stephanie does have a long list of uh, working in e-learning and leadership positions for over 10 years and having taught online uh, with hybrid and online classes uh, for 20 at uh, the graduate and undergraduate level. Uh, Stephanie is also a Quality Matters uh, Master Reviewer and a trainer, and has spoken nationally on issues related to effective teaching and learning in the online environment. So, Stephanie also has a PhD in Educational Leadership, um, also holds a law degree from the University of San Diego, and uh, a couple of various other degrees, so she is very well educated and has been working in our community college system for some time now. And Stephanie, on the personal side, is an avid knitter. For those who know her, have, have seen that. And uh, I did not know she is a novice rower. So good for you. That was that's interesting. Uh, she currently lives in Seattle with her husband and her son. So thank you for coming today, Stephanie. And we'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Mark, and thank you, Alyssa. 
And before I get started, let me just confirm what time I should be sure to wrap up by. Stephanie, if you will just leave me about five minutes at the end to close us out so I can introduce our, our speaker for um, next time and um, thank everyone for attending, um, that should be sufficient. So you have, um, what, 45 minutes? Okay. So you should be good to go. Super. Got lots of time. Um, thanks, everybody. Um, if I, I want to be honest at the upfront with this presentation. If you were at the Washington Canvas Conference, this is going to be a repeat of that. Um, and if you were there and loved it so much you want to hear it again, hooray, because you will. <laughs> if you didn't manage to make it to the Washington Canvas Conference, this will give you an opportunity to, to hear that presentation. Um, we are in some challenging times. Um, as Mark mentioned, I've been in the system for a while, since uh, since 1997, I think. And um, and while there have been, you know, ebbs and flows and good times and bad times, I think just on the overall world scene, times are, are a little tough. And one of the things that we need to do as leaders in the e-learning scene and in higher education is sort of have the the nerve to have challenging conversations. And it's easier said than done. Um, I, I was just in a meeting before this where we were talking about having to have a difficult conversation with an employee um, and how the fact that nobody wanted to have this conversation had, had left that person in place making things difficult for everybody around them for decades. <laughs> and, um, and I'm sure you guys can all think of somebody in your own workplace that um, that has caused difficult ripples because nobody wants to confront that person uh, about uh, the thing that's causing problems. And so what I hope to do in today's conversation is to talk a little bit about um, about how to have those difficult conversations, about the kinds of people that we have those difficult conversations with, and, and hopefully give people opportunities to share some strategies. I want this to be um, a, a creative time where you have something useful that you can actually do differently at the end of this hour than you could have done at the beginning. I'm going to give a quick apology if you hear my cat yowling in the background. I had to do this from home today and hopefully she'll shut up soon. If you would like to, oops, oh, I took that out, did I? Nope, okay. Um, there was a recent study by the Gallup and Knight Foundation, and they talked to uh, about 3,000 college students all over the country about f First Amendment issues and freedom of speech and the like. And what they found was that, that most students thought that it was really important to protect free speech. Um, it, it was important to our democracy as a whole to, to protect free speech. But they also felt, and I guess they also felt like it was important to promote diversity and to have an inclusive society. And that's important to democracy. So this is very helpful. Um, really, you know, on the positive side. Um, but on the opposite side of that, they felt like it was okay sometimes to shut down speakers, um, especially people that said things that were hurtful and harmful um, to people. And if you, it's sort of hard to both have free speech and to let everybody speak. Indeed, people found that the campus climate of political correctness and the like actually prevents people from speaking freely. So the students who were polled feel like it's okay to, um, to speak freely as long as you are saying stuff I like. Um, and we just, we can't do things that way. But they also felt like it was okay to, to do that, to prohibit offensive speech. So don't say anything that will cause anybody harm or distress. Um, we only want people that, that agree with each other. You, you just, 
actually can't have it all of those ways. Um, students found that the, the conversations that mattered, your political conversations, your socially important conversations were taking place mostly online. So we, the conversation that we're having here today about how to have these difficult conversations in the online classroom is especially important because the students that were polled feel like, and I tend to agree, that most of the conversations that we're having about these difficult issues are happening online. And it can be so much easier to be unpleasant or to not actually have conversations, but to just throw comments back and forth to each other when we are in the online space, when you can't see the person on the other side. Uh, and given that, it, it raises challenges that, um, that make it hard to have these conversations. Let's talk about some of the types of challenging people we have to have these difficult conversations with. The first is a bully. And I'm not going to define a bully. I want to give you a minute. If you could just type in the chat box, uh, what to you is a, a feature of a bully? What indicates bullying behavior or a bully to you? Just type that really quick in the chat. Somebody's got a bad attitude. Oh, a troll. Yeah. Somebody who belittles other people. Yeah, bullies take great pleasure in trying to make other people seem small so that they can seem big. Controlling, yeah, derogatory comments. People who are loud and not interested in learning. Intrusive, definitely. Uh, people who are harming with actions and words and abrasive methods of speech. Yeah. People who are rude, <laughs> yep, yep. And this behavior just often comes off as rude. It's hard to treat people that badly <laughs> and be nice. Uh, disrespectful, only their opinion matters. Yeah, condescending, dismissive, yep. So I can see that you guys have this bully thing down. You know what it looks like to be a bully. Um, and you can often see this in the online classroom. You can see people making posts in the discussion board that, um, that put people down or that insult people um, in subtle ways and sometimes not so subtle ways. Public shaming, yeah, we see that happening in the online classroom too. Um, targeting people, um, being dismissive. All of those things we see not only in the face-to-face -face environment, but we see these in the online classroom too, whether it be in individual exchanges on, on discussion boards, uh, in group work in the online classroom. All, uh, we can see this and it can often be sort of uh, stressful to, to try to figure out what to do when you see this happening. And sometimes you may not even believe it is what you see happening. You may not believe your eyes or you may double double check yourself and say, did I really see that? Did they really mean that? Uh, we want to think the best of, of people, but sometimes they really are just being a bully. Um, another kind of unpleasant person that we uh, can see in both the online and face-to-face -face classrooms uh, and work environments, too, this isn't just, uh, just about our instructional classrooms, but our workplaces as well, is, is the microaggression. And I am going to show you a really quick, less than two minute video that really encapsulates microaggressions in a way that I think is useful. And so I'll give you a heads up um, that there is a little bit of profanity in this short video. Um, so let me see if I can share my screen with you and hopefully this will work. Can you guys see that? Yep, okay. Stephanie, we've got it. Looks like it's working. Okay, here we go. For people who still don't think that microaggressions are a problem. Oh, you're so well spoken. Oh, just imagine, instead of being a stupid comment, a microaggression is a mosquito bite. Ugh, it's a compliment. <laughs> mosquito bites and their itch are one of nature's most annoying features. Because you're only bitten every once in a while. No, where are you really from? Uh, Cleveland. Sure. It's annoying, but it's not that big a deal. The problem is that some people get bitten by mosquitoes a lot more than other people. I mean, a lot more. Whether it's on a date. Oh, your English is so good. Going grocery shopping.
stopping. You know, every time for a reason. This is funny. Commuting to work. So when are you going to have a baby? Watching TV. We have to be selective. Or just walking down the street with your partner. I couldn't even tell you were gay. <sighs> mosquitoes seem to pop up everywhere. You know, John, you can stop me if I don't I asked your food. And getting bit by mosquitoes every goddamn day. Don't touch your hair. Multiple times a day. Microaggressions can be super painful uh, to the people who are experiencing them and incomprehensible to the people who don't. And um, I wonder if you have seen um, or experienced microaggressions in an online classroom setting. If so, just take a moment and pop that in the chat, um, condensed if possible. I know it takes a, can sometimes take a while to explain these things, but um, just just a quick yes, you've seen or experienced it, or no, you haven't. So I'm seeing a, seeing a yes there. Experienced it, seen it in the online setting. I think um, it can be even harder to spot in the online setting, especially if you're, well, whether you're um, experiencing it directly or seeing it being done to somebody else, it can sometimes be difficult to see. Um, because again, you want to sort of check yourself and think the best of people and think, well, uh, maybe that's not really what they meant. But frankly, with a microaggression, it doesn't matter what people mean. What matters is how it is uh, received by the person it's aimed at. And so if you have a student or a coworker come to you and say that something happened and they felt like it was a microaggression, that they felt like it was offensive to them, even if it doesn't seem offensive to you or you wonder what's the big deal, uh, take that person at their word. Validate that person's experience that may not be your own. Um, and just because it's not your own, don't think that it, it doesn't exist. I think that's the biggest piece of advice that I can give for people um, who haven't had the opportunity to experience microaggressions. I think that we, that almost everybody uh, has in different settings because microaggressions happen against people uh, not only because of their race or cultural heritage, but because of their size. Maybe you're a particularly short person and, and people give microaggressions against you because you're not very tall or because you're overly tall or because you're overly fat or because you're overly thin. There's, all of us are not the norm in some way. And whenever people are belittling us or making assumptions about us because of that, uh, we're experiencing microaggression. So as we think about those two types of categories and all of the other ways in which people can be difficult, we need to come up with some strategies about what we can do to um, make things more civil in the online classroom. One of the things that I would recommend is trying to stop the conflict before it starts, uh, which of course is easier said than done. One way that you can do that is to build trust. And if you build trust at the beginning of a class, you can really create an atmosphere in which students uh, don't feel comfortable doing the types of things that 
are the hallmarks of a bully or that are the hallmarks of a microaggressor. Uh, people realize that that type of behavior isn't going to be okay. Um, and it can, uh, I'd recommend this book to you, Stephen Covey's The Speed of Trust, as a way to think about um, trust as not just sort of a soft skill, but trust as a valuable commodity, as something that has tangible value in the online classroom and in the workplace. Um, Covey talks about this in ways that I haven't really heard people talking about trust before um, and talks about ways that you can build up trust, ways that you can rebuild trust after it's been broken, or ways that you can create trust in an environment where trust doesn't, doesn't currently exist. Um, building that type of trust is one of the best ways to prevent poor behavior or to give people who are experiencing uh, bad behavior the confidence that they can come forward and that something will be done about it. Um, given that, I'd love for you to take a moment in the chat and share with us your strategies, if you have any, for establishing trust in your online classroom or workplace. Um, go ahead and type your strategies into the chat box. And if you feel comfortable, go ahead and grab the mic or raise your hand so that we can hand you the mic if you'd like to, to talk about a strategy that you have. Don't see any hands yet, but feel free to raise one. Um, Oh, responding quickly to questions. That is a great way of establishing trust because people know if they reach out to you, they will hear back. Ground rules are a fabulous example. Um, letting people know what will happen, you know, how we're supposed to treat each other in the online classroom. And then if people violate that, responding quickly. Um, oh, asking students to locate resources. That's a good idea. Uh, Co-creating communication guidelines. Yeah, definitely. Um, netiquette policies, exactly. Being super clear about expectations and boundaries, um, I think that's really important. Sometimes people feel like, oh, we don't really need to talk about these things. Everybody knows. Well, everybody doesn't know. <laughs> and, um, and, and if things haven't been stated, that really opens the door for, for bad behavior to at least raise its head a little bit. Uh, asking a survey about pronouns and preferred names. I love that. That really lets people know that it's okay to express themselves differently. I think if you do that, it's also really helpful to include some background information, maybe an article or a quick video about, um, about the impact of using different pronouns or ignoring the pronouns that people choose to use after they've expressed what they prefer. Um, because I think that's that's one area that is new to a lot of people, and even if they think that they are um, are being considerate, uh, that's an, an an area where people sometimes feel comfortable being obtuse. I'm not sure why, uh, but anyway, providing some information for people to have a better understanding about multiple genders uh, can be helpful if you're doing that. Um, add some extra details and context of what you say. That's a great idea. Um, remind people about the golden rule. Yeah, I agree. So these are some wonderful ideas about how to establish trust in the classroom at the beginning of the, of the term or at the beginning of a new relationship, uh, whether it be a work relationship or friendships and the like. Um, taking the time, thinking ahead of time and being deliberate about that introductory experience and uh, it's setting up and establishing trust um, and then maintaining it with honorable behavior throughout is an important strategy to being able to avoid having <laughs> the difficult conversations. Um, and we'd, I think we'd all rather avoid it than have to have it. But when we do have to have it, we need to be bold and do it. So that gets us to the next slide, actually dealing with those difficult people. 
So first, we want to go into it. Um, we want to go into it assuming the best intentions. We want to assume that people are acting from a place of goodness, um, acting from a place of, of positivity. I'm going to share a little story with you about an instructor. There was a student in his class, and the student fell asleep, fell asleep in the class. Um, and the instructor was really offended and took it personally. So let me add a little bit of context. The student fell asleep in the class during finals week. It was an international student who was really stressed out about getting good grades. Um, this student dozed off and the teacher called on the student. The student didn't respond because they were asleep and the teacher went on to throw a pencil at the student. When I got a complaint from uh, from our international student office about the teacher's behavior towards the student, the teacher seemed surprised that the student would have the nerve to complain after they had been the one in the wrong having fallen asleep in their class. The teacher did not feel like he had done anything wrong. In fact, he thought that the entire blame laid on the student. It never occurred to the instructor that there might be something else going on, like students stayed up late studying and fell asleep because they were exhausted, and that it actually had pretty much nothing to do <laughs> with the teacher, that it could have been something else. So we want to assume, had the, had the teacher assumed the best intentions of the student, had the instructor sort of thought, Okay, let's set the student being insulting towards me aside. Why else might somebody have fallen asleep in my class? For all he knew, that student was homeless and hadn't been able to sleep the night before. For all he knew, the student was food insecure and hadn't eaten in two days and was too exhausted to be able to stay awake. Um, we need to think the best of potentially bad behavior and wonder why. Why is it coming at us in this way? Keep in mind that, um, especially in writing, we have a negativity bias. When we read things, we think the worst. Um, it's a, uh, we, even neutral things that we see in writing can come off as something that's negative. One way that you might have experienced this personally is if you are an instructor and you have ever gotten student evaluations back, um, and, you know, 99% of your evaluations were super positive and said what a fabulous person you are and how you're the best instructor on the planet and how everybody should take your class. And one person said, I didn't like the class. You totally fixate on that one person. I mean, just completely think, what, what could I have done to get, bring that person around? How come that person didn't like my class? We have this negativity bias. We just want to focus on the negatives. That's why... Um, most popular novels, popular movies, all something dire and bad happens. <laughs> anyway, when we are assuming the best intention, we, we ask ourselves, what is the objective of this person? What is it they're trying to achieve? And why would they be doing what it is that they're doing? Um, is there another way that we can think about this? And going through that mental exercise before having a conversation with a person can be super helpful. Imagine if that instructor hadn't thrown a pencil at the student, but instead had gone up to the student and said, hey, um, uh, you dozed off in my class, and I was just wondering, is everything okay? That's a totally different thing than being bonked over the head with a pencil. So we want to assume best intentions from people when we're going into these conversations. Um, okay. We want to deal with the issue as quickly as possible. A lot of times we think, uh, if I just put this off, um, maybe it'll go away. <laughs> but you know what? Putting things off inevitably makes things worse. People get a lot more upset after a period of time has passed. They wonder, you know, why didn't anybody tell me that, that this was a problem? Why didn't anybody let me know? I would have behaved differently if, if somebody had just talked to me. Um, Sometimes that can be the response, but waiting almost always makes things worse. A lot of times, as I mentioned earlier, we might doubt what we're seeing. Maybe it's not as bad, especially if we do the thing I just said. We assume best intentions. So 
Um, so we think, ah, oh, maybe it, it, what I read wasn't as bad as I thought it was. But in assuming best intentions, that's not an excuse to do nothing. What that is is a way to set your mental framework before you go in and have that conversation now, uh, not putting it off. Um, also, another problem with uh, procrastinating on having these conversations is that uh, legal issues might arise as a result of ignoring a problem that's been reported to you. For example, if you are a direct reporter under Title IX, um, you need to let somebody know right away. You can't put it off. Uh, you can't hope it goes away. You need to act. And, um, you know, so many bad things happen when you hear, well, the institution knew or the teacher knew or somebody at the college knew this bad thing was happening and they did nothing. Um, how often have we seen something like that pop up in the news? I knew that person was a, a risk. I knew they were going to shoot all those people. I heard them say that and I didn't do anything because um, you hoped it would go away. You hoped it wouldn't happen. Uh, let's hope none of us are in a situation that's quite that serious. But Dealing, procrastinating on these difficult conversations rarely yields a good result. So let's take another moment to share in the chat or raise your hand if you um, would like to uh, have the microphone for a moment and talk about a strategy that you use for dealing with difficult people, either uh, in the online classroom or in the workplace. Just uh, quickly share one of your strategies in the chat or raise your hand. Come on, I know people have some strategies for dealing with difficult people. Ask them if there's something that you can do to make things better. Yeah, that's one option. Often people like to complain but don't have, to have uh, too many strategies to bring to the table about how to make improvements and giving them the opportunity can be really helpful. Yep, and I'm going to come back to that about the phone call in just a minute. So yes, I totally agree with that one. Chat with them privately to find out what's going on with them. Yeah, I agree. Um, having a one-on-one -on -one conversation instead of calling people out in front of a group is, is definitely the preferred way to go. Yep, asking to meet one-on-one. -on -one. I agree by making space to pause, um, making space to uh, having space to think for a moment and then asking, you know, did I hear you right? That's a great suggestion. Um, if someone's clearly upset, ask to listen to make, before making assumptions, yeah. Um, trying to put a positive spin on things when possible, yeah. Um, but we don't want to be, and I totally agree because I, I do that too, and we like to think positive. Um, and, but we want to make sure that we don't think so positively and put such a positive spin on things that we ignore problems. I, and it is challenging, and I will give some, some, uh, some scenarios for solutions in just a minute. Um, Thanks for sharing these strategies. That's, I think these are really useful. Um, so what I heard in there was that people are struggling with how to have difficult conversations. I bet that's why you came here today. So <laughs> let's get to that piece. What can you do to have those difficult conversations? First, um, avoid having the conversation in text. We already talked a little bit about the negativity bias that people have when they see things in print and we want to, we tend to think the worst. So I really recommend not 
putting that conversation in print if you're going to have to have a conversation about a difficult topic or with a difficult issue. Um, think about all the things that happen when we have a communication face-to-face. Uh, -face. I mean, right now I'm gesturing with my hands and none of you can see it because I'm not using video. But you think about the tone of voice uh, in a conversation. You think about what's communicated through hand gestures, through facial expressions, through eye contact or lack thereof, um, through the set of one's shoulders, etc. Um, in, when you're having a difficult conversation, you want to bring as many of these to bear as possible to use in your favor in order to have that difficult conversation and convey as much as possible, allowing as little possibility for misunderstanding or misinterpretation as possible. But, you know, the topic of this uh, webinar was how to have these difficult conversations in the online classroom. Um, and here I am telling you not to write it down. What I really want you to do is take that difficult conversation out of the online classroom. If possible, meet in person with the person that you have to have this conversation with. Um, the state board statistics show that most, the vast majority of students who are taking online classes at our colleges are students on our campuses. So most of the students that you have to deal with are not far away and probably can meet with you in person. If having an in-person conversation isn't an option, we have some wonderful options like, uh, like WebEx or Zoom or uh, a free option is conferencecall.com. And we can use those tools to have an almost live-like conversation using video chat or video conferencing. Um, if you, if one person has a video and one person does not, I'd encourage you to have the conversation with neither person using video because we don't want to have it be an unbalanced conversation and um, and using the video, having the ability to see one person definitely would give that person who could do the seeing um, an advantage over the other person. Um, and, you know, there's always the old-fashioned phone calls. Um, you know, just picking up the telephone and having that conversation. If you're going to have a difficult conversation with somebody by telephone, give them a heads up. <laughs> Don't just call somebody out of the blue and jump into a difficult conversation. Uh, give them a chance to prepare. Let them know. Ask them if you, you have something you'd like to talk to them about and when is a good time to have, you know, a, a conversation that will take some time and energy um, and so that, that that person can be prepared to have a difficult conversation. Throwing it out on somebody, you know, while they're driving their car or standing in line at the grocery store, uh, you don't know what you're getting into, especially when we are often uh, talking to people on cell phones. So making sure that a time is reserved for uh, having a conversation you can concentrate on is an important piece of it. Um, I see some, some good ideas popping up in, in the chat, inviting them to your office for a conversation. I totally would recommend that. If you can have that conversation, in person, do it. Another thing that you want to do when you're having that, when you're preparing to have that difficult conversation, is to have an inquiring mind. Um, instead of sort of starting off the conversation, um, for example, with the with the instructor that threw the pencil, instead of starting off with, you know, why did you throw the pencil at that student? Um, I said I heard something happen in your classroom. I wonder if you could could. Tell me about it from your perspective. What happened? And then, you know, the teacher was able to tell their story without knowing one way or another what I thought about it. Just he knew I'd gotten a complaint and I was seeking out some information about, you know, what occurred, not putting out one way or another how I felt about what occurred or what I had heard occurred. Because often in your, when you come to it with an inquiring mind, you find out what you think you knew isn't actually what should be known. So having an inquiring mind, seeking to understand rather than coming in in an accusatory manner um, can be super helpful to your own frame of mind. And when you're, when you're in the right place yourself, it's much easier to have that challenging conversation. Um, uh, earlier when we talked about not putting it off, another downside of putting it off is you stress yourself out. You keep yourself up at night, rehearsing conversations in your head that you might ever have with this person. 
Um, and after you have a lot of those conversations in your head, you may just feel like in such a, a place of stress about it that you might come on more strongly than you intend. So having the conversation early on also enables you to do it in maybe a calmer state. And asking questions and just listening, um, listening not only with your ears, but listening, you know, wholly to what's being said and what's not being said is, is the best way to approach those challenging conversations. Don't be afraid of being quiet and, um, and just listening and and letting the conversation flow into you without constantly thinking in your head how you're going to respond. Uh, let, the, let the conversation happen um, in a more natural way that way. Um, having a difficult conversation, believe it or not, is a skill that can be learned. Um, I have two books that I can recommend on reading to uh, learn this skill, Crucial Conversations or Fierce Conversations. Both of them talk about the steps that one can go through to prepare yourself to have the difficult conversation, having the difficult conversation, and following up on the conversation. I see Lisa Chamberlain noted in the, um, in the text to recap the phone call, making sure all the parties saw it the same way. That's so helpful because things that you think happen in that conversation and things that other people think happen in the conversation may not always be the same thing. And that might lead to yet another conversation. But I would really, if you have ever struggled with a difficult conversation, been afraid to have a difficult conversation, known you needed to have one, but just not even sure how to approach it or wanting to put it off because you were certain no good was going to come of having that conversation, you need to read one of these two books. I just, I can't recommend them. If it was interesting enough for you to come to this seminar, I think you should take the time to read one of these books. They're super. And it's not hard reading, it's quick reading, and it's just super useful strategies that I couldn't possibly begin to summarize um, in the hour that we have here today. Um, I just would really recommend these two books to you uh, to begin to build the skill to have these difficult conversations. In, addif in addition to, as I mentioned, that you, when you're having these conversations, it can sort of rile you up and give you, keep you up at night and give you stomach aches and, and make you stressed all, all around. And so I think an important piece of thinking about having difficult conversations is also taking care of yourself um, and making sure that you are in a good place. It's much easier to have a difficult conversation when you are in a place of calm, in a place of mental peace, in a place of being able to receive whatever it is that's being thrown at you um, in a way that just deflects the negative and takes in the positive. Um, so taking care of yourself is super duper important. One piece of that is to do the worst first. I don't know if, um, if some of you have heard this phrase, eat the frog. If you eat a frog in the morning, then uh, nothing worse can happen to you for the rest of the day. That's what motivated this picture. Um, but yeah, if you do the worst first, if you get the thing out of the way in the morning that you really least want to do, and often it's have that difficult conversation, um, that is a way to take care of yourself. Instead of letting the stress build up as the day goes on, um, you get it over with, and then you can approach the rest of your day with a calmer sense, um, a, a calmer a sense of peace and often the thing that you were dreading and not wanting to do is not as bad as you thought it was going to be uh, if you tackle it early in the morning. There's been some new research that shows that our willpower is a, a, a diminishing resource and gets smaller and smaller as the day goes on with less and less willpower, which is if you're one of those people who binge eats at night, that's why. You have lots of willpower in the morning, not so much at night. And I, I think that, that that same thing applies here. You're, you're much better able to do hard things at the beginning of the day uh, when you have more energy than at the end of the day. On the other hand, if you're a person who has more energy at the end of the day, then maybe that's the time to take on this difficult work. 
So I would love it if you would, as our last chat activity for this session, take a moment to share in the chat box your favorite method of self-care. If you had to have a difficult conversation this morning, what would you do to take care of yourself uh, after that was over? Now to massages. I love that. Going for a run, meditation, swimming, museum, going for a walk, laughing, I, that's great, doing crossword puzzles, lots of good activities. Unplugging, I love how almost all of these, all of these are free. It's not like you have to, to spend a chunk of change to take care of yourself. Um, you can just walk outside or um, read a, a good book, yeah. Lots of wonderful suggestions there on how to take care of yourself. Um, yeah, avoid the news, definitely. <laughs> um, so I hope that this has given you some ideas about what gives rise to some difficult situations in the online classroom, how you might prevent difficult situations from arising how you can address those difficult conversations, how you can get more ideas about strategies on having the difficult conversations, and then how to take care of yourself before and after those conversations. I hope this has done all of that for you and raised your interest in this so that you might read those two or three books that I recommended in the slides. Um, and if all of that happens, then I feel like our time here has been a success. If you, I, I thank you for your attention today and for taking the time to come and hear this presentation. If you have any questions about this, feel free to get in contact with me. Alyssa, I'm guessing you have a way to share these slides out with people. Um, I'm happy to do that and also to share out the, um, the studies that I referenced at the beginning of the, of the talk. Yeah, Thanks the so slides. Much. Great to hear you two guys, or at least see you guys in the chat. Yep, the slides will go up on the ATL blog that I mentioned at the intro. And um, once this is re the recording has been submitted for captioning, we'll put the recording up too. Um, I haven't posted the slides just yet, but they'll be there within a week or so. So um, just watch for that. You should be able to find those um, fairly easily. And um, if you need that link again, let me just grab that for you in case you missed it at the beginning. I just need to scroll through my document here, and I will just put that into the chat again. So um, this is the link to the ATL blog, and you can um, find all the recordings and resources and things from today's webinar and past webinars there. Um, I am going to go ahead and make myself the presenter again so we can close this out. But before we close out, um, we do have a few extra minutes. So does anybody have any additional questions for Stephanie on this topic or um, anything that she presented today. Uh, we did have a lot of activity in the chat, so that was um, fantastic. But if there was something that you're curious, um, learning a little bit more about or want to ask a question, please feel free to go ahead and um, put that into the chat for us. And um, we'll go ahead and address those now if you have um, any additional questions. Yes. I'm Definitely happy to answer any questions that you have. So we'll just see if anybody wants to add anything there. Um, feel free to raise your hand or just type it in if you do have a question. I'm going to go ahead and switch back to our um, other slides. And if there aren't any questions, I'll just go ahead and um, tell you all about our um, upcoming IGNIS in a couple of weeks. All right, doesn't look like we're getting anything into the chat right now, and I don't see any hands have gone up, so I'm just going to go ahead and keep talking. But if something pops into the chat, we will just go ahead and stop and address that. Um, first, I'd like to thank Stephanie um, 
even though I've seen this twice now, um, because I was at the conference where she presented this um, just a couple of weeks ago, um, this was fantastic, and um, it was actually really great to hear it a second time. So you might all find it useful to go back and watch the recording. And I will say that um, that same day that you presented this at the conference, Stephanie, later that afternoon at the grocery store, I witnessed something where if the people had practiced this, um, they would not have had an altercation right in front of me. It was like about two feet away from where I was standing. And um, if the person had just assumed best intentions, um, there would not have been a big yelling, screaming match in the middle of um, the grocery store. So I saw immediate application for this. Granted, it was outside the online classroom, but I was just like, wow, that couldn't have been any more timely. So um, I do yeah. want to thank you for sharing because I really learned a lot. Yeah, it's, these are tough times. Yeah, so I'm not going to go into explaining it. I just was like, wow, I can't believe I witnessed this on the same day she talked about it. So, yeah, incredibly timely. All right, so um, I'd like to invite you all back um, in a couple of weeks on April 26th. We will do our third, um, that's my timer to to stop and um, remind Stephanie to stop talking, but she ended early. Um, so I'd like to invite you all back um, on April 26th. Again, it'll be a Thursday afternoon from 2 to 3, and um, we'll be joined by Zoe Fisher from Pierce College. She's an associate instructional designer there, and she's going to um, come and present to us about um, using Respondus for securing assessments and um, whether or not those should be locked down or not. So um, that should be a good one and um, a good topic because I don't really know a lot of about using Respondus, so hopefully um, you guys will find it useful as well. Uh, here is uh, my contact information and Mark's contact information, just in case you have any questions about um, today's webinar or can't remember where to find the resources or um, might be interested in presenting for us um, next year, please uh, feel free to give me a shout, and I'm just putting um, my email address and Mark's email address into um, the chat there for you just in case you need it. And um, just want to thank everybody for coming and attending today and participating. That was fantastic participation. I don't think I've seen um, that much participation in any of our webinars to date. So thank you uh, for being involved and participating with Stephanie and um, being active participants in the webinar today. So um, thank you again. And it looks like we're going to close out just a little bit early. And um, just so you know, if there's anything in the IGNIS content that you find useful for your own purposes, it is um, under a Creative Commons license, so please feel free to use and repurpose anything that you've seen today. So um, again, thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Mark, for co-hosting with me. Um, any last words from anybody? All right, I'm going to go ahead and turn our recording off so I don't forget to do that. And thanks again, and hopefully we will see you.